morning. Welcome back to the special edition of The Early Show on this um, Wednesday morning focusing on the attack on America. Normally this shot would include the uh, twin towers of the World Trade Center in the background of the Empire State Building. But as I think you know by now, the, um, the towers are gone. That's what the shot looked like just yesterday at this time, and that's what it looks like this morning. Absolutely unbelievable. Looking down Madison Avenue or Fifth Avenue when we left the studio yesterday, yeah. it was so haunting to see those buildings gone and the smoke billowing, billowing into the Well, into I told you from, from, from my windows at home, I mean, there were so many eerie sights. I mean, looking south, you just saw these big balloons of, of, of smoke and, and you'd look down at the west side highway and there was, you know, and that's a live shot right now. I mean, you can still, still billowing see, there. You can still see, that's basically pulverized concrete that is, um, that is floating up like that and you look down at the west side highway there's no movement at all and if you look all the way south you just see blinking lights I mean it's it's absolutely an unbelievable scene here in the city watching, of Manhattan. I was watching coverage um, at home in my living room when the seventh building of the World Trade Center collapsed. Yeah, the number seven building, yeah. And and then the smoke That's comes up again. That's a 47-story structure, yes, by the is. way. I mean, we're not talking about a very small building. That's a 47-story structure. So I'm seeing it on the news and then turn and look out my window and there it is. Yeah, and watch all the um, yeah. all the dust. Um, the New York newspapers are, as you might imagine, um, dedicated entirely to it. This is uh, the uh, grand old lady, uh, New York Times, U.S. attacked. Um, this is the uh, the Daily News. It's war, front and back page, and um, the New York Post echoing the um, the same sent sentiment, um, complete with the uh, with the plane just before the uh, second impact act of war. Amazing. Um, let's kind of bring you up to speed. Here's the latest. Rescue workers are uh, this morning searching for survivors and victims in the massive pile of rubble that was once the World Trade Center, but it may take weeks to get an accurate casualty count. In a speech to the nation last night, President Bush talked about thousands of lives ended. There is no air travel in the United States. All airports in the United States and Canada remain closed at least until noon Eastern time today. The federal government is open for business, but the uh, major American stock markets are not. And U.S. officials are beginning to tie the attack to the terrorist Osama bin Laden. Communications linked to bin Laden followers talking about the attack have been intercepted. Jane? Right, as you mentioned, it may be a while before officials get a clear idea of the toll in human lives following the plane attacks. Tracy Smith is at Bellevue Hospital in New York with the latest on that. Tracy, good morning. Good morning, Jane. You know, this enormous loss of life has touched people all over the country, but here in New York, it is very personal. Not only did thousands of people stand on the street and watch this tragedy unfold before their eyes, thousands more knew someone, a friend, a family member, who was working in the World Trade Center. A lot of them still don't have word on what happened to their loved ones, and for them, this is an agonizing wait. Jane? Tracy, where are most people going uh, this morning? Where are they directed to go to get good information about the what's happening today? The the hospitals have set up information centers uh, that people can go to if they're concerned about their loved ones. The problem is each hospital has its own list of patients that were admitted, so people are having to make the rounds, go from hospital to hospital to see if their loved one is on that list. And all of the people that I talked to have not had any luck. No one so far has found anyone. So it just, it, it's really horrible for so many people just waiting and hoping and losing hope. And I've heard that some people are actually going back to the scene of the attack if they can get there. For what reason, Tracy? I think people yesterday, right after that initial attack, didn't know what to do. I met a young man who went down there looking for his cousin and was actually down there when the second tower fell, when it collapsed. He got thrown six feet in the air, ended up getting a piece of glass tore into his arm. He had to go to the hospital himself uh, and still no word on his cousin. I think people are just at a loss as to what to do. All right, Tracy Smith at Bellevue Hospital in New York. Tracy, thank you. In Los Angeles, Robert Butterworth is a clinical psychologist who specializes in helping people with grief and trauma. Mr. Butterworth, good morning. Good morning. The nation is in shock this morning, as you can well understand. How do you think most people are going to react this morning, waking up with the news well, you know, of what happened yesterday? Well, you know, we're, we're on day uh, two, and, and, you know, the first day or two, we're, we're really still in that sense of shock and disbelief. But I see what we're going to have to do is that you're going to see it now. People are going to start getting upset 
angry. You, there's this depression and this disbelief is going to turn into anger and action. There's going to be a sense of we have to do something. This can't happen in America. And for us, you know, we've seen terrorism around the world, but it has never really hit home till now. So really, we could almost call this an, an, end, an end of innocence. Well, a lot of, speaking of the end of innocence, a lot of children are asking questions this morning about what happened yesterday. What are you telling parents? What's your advice about well, how to deal with that? You know, for kids that are in school, I think we have to tell them. I mean, you, we would love to try to hide this from them or, or try to say that the world is a wonderful place, but this, this can't be hidden. I mean, they're going to be talking about this in school or talking about it in the community. And sadly, with kids, it's what they don't know that hurts them what they, rather than what they know. And I think parents have to sit down and talk to youngsters in a way that they can understand depending on the age. Because, you know, we know reports of kids not being able to study, being hysterical, not sleeping. Sleeping. And you know, it's a world that these kids are, are living in, and, and sadly, they're looking at us like we failed them. Let's break it down specifically. What would you say to a younger child about what happened, and then to an older child? Okay, well, the kids that then are just starting school, I think you have to let them understand that, you know, this did not necessarily happen in your neighborhood. A lot of youngsters that don't have a geographical sophistication may not have any idea where this is happening, and they may think that, my God, I'm on my way to school, is something going to happen? The older kids, however, they're going to be a, more of a sense of anger and frustration. These are kids that are used to acting on things, they're used to doing things, they're not just sitting and talking. So there's going to be a sense of what can we do? That's why we're getting reports of kids around the country going around and collecting money. These nickels and dimes may not mean that much uh, to the victims, but are going to mean a lot to kids because they're going to feel that they're doing something to make the world a better place. And for those who lost loved ones yesterday, I mean, it's, it's unimaginable the feelings they must have today. It, it's a new world. It's a new reality. Uh, and, and it's, again, the, the pain is just starting, and, and this is something that's going to be with them their entire life. And, and, and for these people, they could just try to just put one foot in front of the other and try to survive. These are the heroes, the people that try to survive this. These are the people in our culture that we have to look up to because, you know, they went through something that most of us will never go through. And, and they just have to go on. And, and that's the hope in America that they will. There are a series of steps to every grief recovery period. But the truth of the matter is, Mr. Butterworth, you never, you never get over something like this, do you? The closer to you are, that you are to death and destruction, the harder it is. And, and we know from, from disasters, both natural disasters, and what we saw in Oklahoma City is that this takes years. So we're going to see the trauma counselors for the next few weeks talking to people. But we have to remember, it's not going to be for the next few years, or it may be for a lot of people for, for decades. And, and that's the sad thing about this. Robert Butterworth in Los Angeles. Thank you. Thank you. 6.37 Eastern Time. Brian. All right, Jane. On Tuesday morning, Mike Walter was driving to work on a Virginia highway right next to the Pentagon when he witnessed an airplane crashing into the nerve center of the U.S. defense system. Mike Walter is in Washington this morning. Mr. Rich, Walter, good morning. Uh, I'm not going to bother you unless there's something. Mr. Walter, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm sorry. Thank you, sir. Um, 9.43 yesterday morning, American Airlines Flight 77 out of Newark, 64 people aboard. Where were you? Uh, as you said, I was on Highway 27, uh, stuck in traffic, frustrated with uh, the morning commute in Washington, as it is in many large cities. Uh, it had just kind of, uh, kind of gone to a standstill, and uh, and I looked over to the left. I heard the jet first, and I saw it as it was banking, Bryant, and it came in front of me, and I could see the the big red letters AA, the silver fuselage, and then I followed it as it went uh, in the steep decline and as it nosedived right into the Pentagon. It went behind some trees. I, I'm, you know, at that help, point help, it was Help me of, out a little bit because okay. I'm, I'm, I'm less familiar with the geography of the area than you are. The road that you were on is an elevated passway? Yes, yes. Okay, it's, so you were at a higher level than the Pentagon. Right, right, absolutely. How much higher are we talking about? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a good question. I'd probably say uh, 30, 40 feet. I was about 75 yards away from the building. So you're about 75 yards away from, so that plane had to be pretty close to the top of your vehicle. It was probably, I'd say about, you know, I'm guessing now, I mean, it, it seemed like it was about 10, 20 feet uh, above wow. the cars and it was coming down and, and whoever was piloting that plane, I mean, it, it was almost like a, a cruise missile with a pilot. I mean, it was just headed right for the Pentagon, going very, very fast and uh, completely eviscerated once it, uh, on impact.
Tell me, if you could, about the manner in which the, um, the plane struck the building. I ask that because in the pictures we have seen, it appears to be a gash in the side of the Pentagon as if the plane went in vertically as opposed to mm -hmm. horizontally. Can you tell me anything about that? Well, as I said, you know, there were trees obstructing my view. So I saw it as it went, and then, then the trees, and then I saw the, the fireball and the smoke. Uh, some people have said that uh, the plane actually uh, went on its side and in that way. Uh, but I can't tell you, Brian. Uh, I just know that what I saw was this massive fireball, a huge explosion, and, and a the thick column of smoke, and then an absolute bedlam on those roads as people were trying to get away. I mean, some people were going on the emergency lanes, and they were going forward while others were trying to back up. But one woman in front of me was in a panic and waving everyone back, saying, back up, back up. They've just hit the Pentagon. Um, it, was, it was total chaos. As, as I note, this happened at 9.43. Um, that was uh, almost an hour after the, um, the first plane hit the World Trade Center. Were you aware of the attacks in the World Trade Center at the time? Oh, absolutely, Brian. I was listening to the radio accounts. In fact, I had just, uh, they'd just broken in with the second attack, and, uh, and they had run uh, some sound from the president uh, talking about how he had contacted the vice president. But yet, uh, it, it didn't register with me when I was watching this. It wasn't as though I said, oh, here's the thing. Yeah, I was going to ask. I mean, it, it, I mean, there's no reason to think, I mean, no. as you're riding there, you weren't thinking, oh, this is the same part of a, no. a coordinated attack. No, I, I didn't think that at all. All I thought was that plane's very, very low, and then I watched it, and I kept saying to myself, it's going to crash, it's going to crash. And then when it did, I just kept saying, oh, my God, and, and I was not alone. I mean, the, the, I will never forget the faces of the people around me. I mean, we all shared something yesterday that uh, none of us would ever want to share. It was, it was unbelievable. As you might imagine, Mr. Walter, we've been focusing a great deal on what people are feeling up here in, in New York, where, where the tragedy is, is, is so enormous, um, that around here people are walking around in, uh, in, in, in stunned disbelief. Um, characterize, if you could, for me the feeling down there where you are. I think that's a good characterization, Bryant. Uh, you know, yesterday there were uh, there were a number of people. Everybody basically pulled out their cell phones and tried to call their family members to tell them they were okay, and you couldn't get a call out. But I mean, once people got past that, I saw people. You know, some some servicemen telling me they were sick to their stomach. Others, uh, you know, just kind of dissolved into tears. And at uh, one point, you know, I just tried to throw myself into my work yesterday, but at one point I, I started uh, crying and this army officer told me, he said, look, you're in a state of shock, you know, and, and I think that's when it first registered. I, I think the enormity of it all, I kept trying to push it away while I was working, but then it finally hit me and, and yeah. it's been very, very difficult. Were you able to sleep last night? You know, I didn't want to go to bed last night. I was terrified of it. I, I thought I was going to have nightmares, but I did. I got about four or five hours of sleep. And, and, and one thing I would like to say, Brian, is, is my heart goes out to all those people yesterday. Um, you know, uh, I just really feel for all those servicemen uh, who were there and their families. Mike Walter, thank you. If you cried, you're not alone. Thanks. Thank you. 640. This is Brian Gumbel in New York as the early show will continue throughout the morning. CBS coverage continuing throughout the day here in Boston. Scott Wally along with uh, Carrie Connolly. And uh, the country came to a standstill yesterday, Carrie, when, uh, when these planes hit the towers. The, the uh, stock markets were, were shut down. They'll be closed again today. Disney World closed. The Mall of America closed. Major League Baseball canceling games for the first time since D-Day for reasons other than work stoppages. And uh, for the first time in our history, uh, U.S. air travel was halted yesterday. That's right. And Dan Ray joins us now from Logan Airport, which is obviously closed this morning, along with all the airports across the country. Dan, the question many people asking this morning, how did not one but two planes leaving Boston both get hijacked? How did these people get through with weapons through the security? Those are the questions, Carrie. Good morning to you and good morning to Scott. And we'll try to get a little bit of uh, insight, if not answers, to them in just a moment. But first of all, both Boston newspapers this morning uh, suggesting that indeed the um, problems may have begun here yesterday. We do know that the two planes left Logan Airport uh, just around the 8 o'clock hour. Both of them then crashed into the World Trade Center's buildings in New York. And the Herald and the Globe this morning both have some reports indicating that the suspects in this um, terrible tragedy, disaster, uh, may have crossed over the border from Canada. 
uh, gone down to Portland, Maine, and then taken some sort of a uh, quick flight from Portland, Maine, in here to Logan Airport. Uh, there's some questions that there might have been some sort of a scuffle in a garage, the parking garage here at Logan Airport, and that has led the investigators to uh, a, a vehicle, uh, which was a national car rental, we understand. That vehicle has been impounded by investigators here at the airport, and they are now looking for uh, what they believe to be five Arab men inside that vehicle. There were materials uh, cl found, uh, apparently a Koran as well as a videotape telling uh, someone uh, in Arabic uh, how to fly an airplane. So there's uh, a lot of developments out here, and as a result, we have all of the investigators. Uh, we'll be able to take um, a quick shot of Logan this morning. You can see that Logan is shut down, as all other airports around the country, and the suspicion is that Logan Airport is probably going to be one of the last airports to reopen when the FAA allows airports uh, to reopen. Uh, joining me now uh, live from the Airport Journal uh, is Bob Weiss. And, Bob, let's talk about how these security lapses could have occurred. It's uh, two airlines, it's two air terminals here at Logan Airport, and two groups of people who should have been checking more closely. How could this happen? Well, uh, Logan has had its share of uh, problems, fines, other things, as have many airports. And we have three airports involved here, just to me, an amazing turn of events. Uh, the security problem uh, is the airline's problem in conjunction with the FAA and Massport. But uh, the costs involved go to the airlines. And my personal opinion is uh, the airlines are going to have to rethink this entire uh, situation, probably uh, hire more trained personnel, plus the fact that if uh, they do eliminate uh, curbside uh, check-in, which I'm sure they're going to do, this means that all the bags uh, that are going to be checked in are going to be checked in at the counter, so people are going to have to get to the airport earlier, and it's just a whole new ball game out here. But from a security point of view, as, as I've gone through airports around the country, one of the things that I notice, and, and, and forgive me for saying this, is that most of the people who are on the security teams, uh, th they tend to me to be look people who are perhaps in their first or second job uh, many of them are non non English speaking or English as a second language and as I understand it these people are paid r pretty close to the minimum wage and that's an air airlines decision not to hire better trained people well I think that's absolutely true uh, the uh, statistics seem to be that there's a hundred percent turnover in these people you know per per year and it's somewhat similar to uh, what the airlines did when they eliminated you know we used to get your bags uh, when you picked them up at the carousel they used to check all the tags the airlines decided that was an expense that they didn't want did not want to have and they uh, you know cut cut back so i think everything is going to be weighed here and it's going to be a whole new so, situation so by cutting corners the airline now has opened these airlines have opened themselves up i think to tremendous uh, legal liability i'm sure the lawsuits are going to be in the millions if not billions of dollars for all of these people who now can say that perhaps their loved ones lost their lives because of inadequate security procedures that the airline should have had in place well we'll have to see but uh, I'm sure uh, that's a direction which a, a lot of people are uh, going to go in. We're a little bit away from there. I think if the airport does get open tomorrow, I'd be very surprised if it, if it opens today. Uh, but if it opens tomorrow or, uh, you know, towards the end of the, the week, I think you're going to notice some major changes. One point that you mentioned, and again, talking about the folks who, uh, who man the uh, magnometers, uh, magnetometers, uh, as well as the x-ray machines, you're telling me that for the most part, it's a 100% turnover. So the person who scans you today or looks at your luggage, that person is gone to another occupation by just a year from now. Yeah, that's correct. And one of the things about the airport... Sort of like McDonald's. Well, it, it, basically, one of the studies that's been done showed that there are more uh, first-time jobs created at airports than any other uh, uh, business around in the New England, uh, you know, area. So people hook on. They may start as security screeners. They may start out driving cars around the airport to or for rent-a-car companies and, and, you know, work themselves out. You've got 17,000 people working in and around the airport here. Uh, we've just all got to be much more vigilant. But you have, for example, criminal justice uh, graduates coming out of schools like Northeastern University who have been trained in criminal justice, have a college degree. They can't get jobs at local police departments. Uh, and, and, and they're working in, in jobs where they would probably be better qualified to work here at the airport. Do you think the airlines now will in take that increased expense and hire more qualified people? Well, I think they're going to have to. 
But the other side of the situation here, as I said before, to have four of these lapses at, at uh, you know, three airports, this was obviously an extremely well-planned uh, thing. Uh, my own personal opinion is that uh, whoever masterminded this thing hoped that maybe one or two of these aircraft would get in the air, but to get them all in the air is a major uh, failing of the system, and that's what I think has to be looked at. Okay, Bob, thanks very much. Uh, Bob Weiss of the Airport Journal. Certainly, I don't think anyone knows this airport uh, better than he. Uh, some interesting insight as to the security lapses that clearly occurred here at Logan Airport. Two terminals, two airlines yesterday. We'll be here throughout the morning. We expect to hear from officials from Massport later on during the day. Again, Bob Weiss is speculating that this airport will not even reopen today. We know it would reopen at the earliest at noon this morning. So even if you have a flight there's, uh, early before noon, there's no sense to come to Logan Airport until you hear the airport is reopened. For now, Dan Ray live at Logan Airport. Back to you, Scott and Kerry. All right, Dan Ray, thank you. And as you may have seen on the headline bar below you, we were talking about earlier, Scott, in the Boston Herald this morning, there is a quote from a former FBI terrorist specialist claiming that uh, Boston was definitely the staging area for the tragedy that happened yesterday, and there is possibly uh, a terrorist cell as we speak right now operating out of Boston. He's quoted as saying that they obviously had help from down below, which uh, very easily could have been right here in Boston, which is very frightening thought. and hopefully being investigated. Uh, but we do want to get to something very important. We know you have a lot of questions this morning. We're getting new information on the list of people on board the two planes that left from Boston. And this is uh, by no means a complete a casualty list, but here are some of the names as we have them right now. Ken Waldy, a Raytheon employee from Methuen. Uh, another Raytheon employee, Peter Gay uh, from Andover. Richard Ross, 58 years old. He ran a consulting firm in Newton. Uh, Neely Casey of Wellesley. Mark Bavis, uh, a great hockey player who played under Jackie Parker at BU. Uh, he was from Providence, Rhode Island, and he was a scout for the NHL's Los Angeles Kings, 31 years old. Garnet Ace Bailey was 53 years old of Linfield. He was the director of pro scouting for the Los Angeles Kings hockey team. He was also a former Boston Bruins player. David and Lynn Angel, he was the executive producer of the NBC TV show Frasier. The couple was returning from their home in Chatham. Also, Daniel Lewin, 31 years old, the co-founder of Akamai Technologies in Cambridge. Brian Sweeney, 38 years old, of Barnstable, and Jane Orth, 49, of Haverhill. The list uh, continues. John Hayhill, uh, Cahill of Wellesley. The uh, co-pilot and pilot, respectively, of American Airlines Flight 11, the uh, first hijacked plane to hit one of the towers yesterday. The co-pilot was Tom McGinnis from Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and uh, the pilot also Boston-based from Drake at John Oganowski. From Worcester, Tara Creamer and uh, Ted Hennessy of Belmont, Massachusetts. Peter, Susan, and Christine Hansen, all from Massachusetts. Christine, only two years old. Charles Jones, 48, of Bedford. Bill Weems of Marblehead. David Retnick of Needham. And the list continues. Robin Kaplan from Natick. Anna Williams Allison of Stoneham. Jeffrey Coombs from Abington. Uh, from Wilmot, New Hampshire, Thelma Cuccinello. Alex Filipoff of uh, Concord, New Hampshire. He was 70 years old. 46-year-old Paige Farley Hackle of Newton. Amy Jarrett, 28 years old of North Smithfield, Rhode Island. Jesus Sanchez, only 45 years old of Hudson. James Hayden was 47 of Westford. Ruth McCourt, 24, also of Westford. Juliana Valentine McCourt, four years old, also of Westford and Sean Nassany, 25 of Pawtucket, Rhode Island and Lynn Goodchild, 25 of Attleboro. And as Scott mentioned earlier, this is obviously not the complete list. As soon as we get all the names, we will certainly make sure that they are available to you. There were, uh, I believe, 266 people uh, on board the four hijacked planes, uh, but on the ground, of course, the 800 or more uh, feared dead in the uh, Pentagon attack and uh, the casualty list in lower Manhattan uh, will, will go into the uh, thousands uh, for sure. Yes, and we're looking at live pictures in the top of your screen there. Mayor Giuliani talking about the fact that there are survivors still in the rubble, many calling from their cell phones, trapped inside looking for help. Uh, in downtown Boston yesterday, I was down there, it was like a ghost town, Scott. Everybody evacuated their buildings, starting with the John Hancock, the Prudential, all the high rises obviously first, but Many of the businesses, many of the restaurants closed down as well. Sure. Uh, and some of the uh, 
some of the stories uh, emanating from New York yesterday are just um, just amazing. The couple who, uh, according to several eyewitnesses, jumped from one of the mm -hmm. towers mm -hmm. hand in hand. Mm -hmm. People jumping from uh, these buildings from as high as the 80th floor. And Anthony Mason, a, a CBS News reporter, uh, last evening talking with Dan Rather, he said 50 floors, Morgan Stanley leases 50 floors of one of these towers. This is the financial nerve center of the world, uh, Lower Manhattan, with a stock exchange close at hand. And uh, he said that in the people in the second tower were being evacuated after the plane hit the first tower. And he, was, he talked to a man who was going down the stairs during an orderly evacuation. But at one point, they got the all clear in that building. Mm -hmm. In other words, the second tower was secure. And this witness uh, told Anthony Mason that at that point, some of the workers in that office turned around and went back up the stairs mm. and went back up into the elevators. And it was just a few minutes later that that tower was hit by a jumbo jetliner. Incredible. And back here in Boston today, Scott, uh, the MBTA is running the Amtrak, uh, running as well. Logan Airport, as we know, is closed. Uh, Jane Swift sending stress counselors to downtown. As we know, lots of folks headed back to work. Business as usual this morning. Many of the, high ri the folks working in the high rises will be uh, counseled this morning in hopes of helping them get through the day. So let's get right down to downtown Boston where Christina Hager joins us now live with the scene down there. Christina, good morning. Good morning, Carrie. Well, we were out here all day yesterday and uh, it was, as you put it a few minutes ago, it was like a ghost town here. Everyone had left. Well, now we are beginning to see some traffic and some pedestrians around us the uh, city beginning to wake up. It's back to business for those who work in the prominent high-rise buildings here in the Back Bay, buildings like the Prudential you see behind me and uh, the John Hancock where thousands were evacuated yesterday as a security precaution in the wake of those terrorist attacks. And we caught up with a Boston man earlier this morning, someone on his morning walk who was very emotional about what had happened, a World War II veteran. He broke down in tears as he talked to us about what had happened. I was around when they dropped the atom bomb. Harry Truman said, in order to protect millions of servicemen, the invasion of Japan, we're going to devastate the country. Same thing happened in New York City. And I see the Palestinians yelling and screaming with joy. I remember the joy that we were showing in America when the atom bombs were dropped, killing hundreds of thousands of people. Some heavy thoughts, heavy hearts as people return to work today. Back to work for all state and city employees. Acting Governor Jane Swift has said it is important to return to business as usual, as much as that is possible. She says it's important not to let these terrorists get in the way of our daily lives and our business. Live in Boston, Christina Hager, WBZ4 News. Back to you, Scott and Carrie. That's a sense in the federal level as well, Christina. Thank you very much. But of course, nothing will ever be normal no, again but it's important to to show a, a face of normalcy as much as possible especially on the federal level uh, you know this uh, our country has been buckled but certainly not broken and we're going to take a break from the news right now and find out about your weather forecast on this Wednesday. Barry Burbank is in the weather office with more. Barry, good morning. Good morning, Carrie, and good morning, Scott. Hi, everybody. On this Wednesday morning, we're starting out with nice sunshine. It is clear, but it's on the cool side. We've got to Boston to 59 right now. It's 60 down in New York City. Both places are completely clear with light winds. And we'll stay that way most of the day. We find a 40 in Concord, New Hampshire, 48 in Fitchburg, 42 in Nord. So it's a chilly start to this September 12th. And we're looking for sunshine just about all day long. Now, Aaron continues out at sea, uh, just off the map here, still close to New England, and still generating some uh, big swells, five to seven foot waves crashing on shore. We'll have most of the cloudness today going across northern New England this afternoon. A few scattered clouds will be showing up here. That's about it. So our forecast is calling for a sunny Wednesday. Just a few clouds this afternoon, and there will be a light breeze turning into the onshore direction. That means along the coast, it'll cap the temperature from going much higher than the upper 60s, but inland a few miles, it should be up to the middle 70s. So that's the way we're looking. Tomorrow should be in the 70s. We'll get most of our showers tomorrow night and Friday morning, but unusually 
cold weather on Friday. Uh, the sun will try to pop through in the afternoon, upper 50s, then a little bit milder this weekend. That's my latest forecast, Carrie and Scott. All right, Barry, thank you. It is 6.59. We are going to have continuing coverage as the chilling images are still very, very real from yesterday's horrific tragedy. The, the uh, rescue crews continue in New York City this morning searching for survivors. Locally, of course, uh, in this country, the focus is on uh, the rescue efforts, both at the Pentagon and uh, in New York. Uh, internationally, the focus will be on finding who did this and exacting justice. CBS News coverage continues now here on WBZ. We will continue uh, for local coverage on UPN 38. We invite you to join us on 38.